were sitting, much like I am now, looking out the window, very tired. Can't sleep past dawn anymore. It's really just an irritant. The sun coming in the window so early. It's also a beautiful thing to witness, the way it takes possession of the sky, bleeding into the remnants of the night. I have time for this now, to stay and watch. Arthur was still asleep, of course, and a little restless. There was a cardinal in the bough of the tree just there. I took a picture of it, and I took a picture of Arthur sleeping. He hates it when I do that. I remind myself to tell him we need to prune that bough because during the last storm, it was knocking up against the window. And with a heavier wind, it would have broken that glass. Then we'd have to fix it. We'd have to get it fixed, and I don't want anyone coming in the house. So then we'd have to live with that broken window. We'd have to see it every day. And that would be demoralizing. Mother came in, she's here now living with us. She was restless and as sweet as ever and asked me for the umpteenth time what I was doing awake so early. I said I could ask you the same question. She gave me the answer, the only answer she ever gives anymore. Well, I'm old, so I'm allowed. An ambulance went by, siren wailing. Then another, then another. That's what woke me up, she said. I answered that it could be. The sirens were worse at night, who knows why. But at night, nothing keeps me awake. Falling asleep is the easy part. Staying asleep, well, I simply can't do it. It's because I can't stop paying attention. I can't give up my vigilance for too long. I said loudly, Arthur needs to prune that bough because it knocks up against the window and Arthur rolled over and said, I'll do it today. That's what I wanted to hear. Mother went over to the bed and pulled up the blanket almost under Arthur's chin, let him sleep. He's a good man, she whispered. He's the best. I couldn't agree more, but I miss him when he's asleep and I'm awake. I also get jealous. I believe he's the son she never had. I complimented my mother on her lovely nightgown and pointed to the white lace placket, the high Victorian collar. You have two of those, the same, only with three buttons instead of four. Mother's hand flew to her throat, touching the buttons. She looked down, then back up at me silently, accusing me of swiping one of her buttons. I bought two of these nightgowns. They're exactly the same. It's impossible. They're brand new. One might have fallen off, I said. She was getting agitated. I just bought them. How could you possibly notice? You must be wrong. I mean, they're made by machine, not hand-stitched in some sweatshop. I told her I was probably wrong, and she was right. How did I know? It's just that I remember details now. Details that I never would have noticed a month ago. There are so many details in our world. This world, our house, this garden, that's the perimeter for now, but it is so full of unobserved events, of minuscule adjustments. The invisible made visible because of some comic demand to be seen. The cardinal's red color is most vivid in the morning. The crows show up at cocktail hour every day. Our neighbor's cat has a slight overbite. I mean, we are just guests on this planet. Mother went button searching and in a rush of apology, told me to go back to bed, relax, watch something on Netflix. She was gonna make pancakes for me and Arthur, blueberry with butter and syrup. I go back over to the window and I pulled the bucket, the small bucket that I painted blue on the hung on the hook just below the window sill. Arthur drilled into the brick wall of our house to anchor the hook, set the whole thing up, never even asked what it was for. It's my rain bucket. I just look into it, give the water a swirl and notice how much accumulation there's been since the last rainfall. I keep track of it and I learn things. For instance, 
Do you know how many viruses there are in the world? More than there are stars in the entire universe. They swarm in the water of my pail, in the rainfall, in the ocean, the deep blue sea that is the cradle of life. Arthur woke up and said, good morning, beautiful, another siren. He ran his fingers through his hair. It's hard getting used to this, he said. I worry that he doesn't have enough structure in his life, that events go by in a rush, in a whisper, but there's no accumulation of time, no measurement of achievement. I told him I had a few ideas of projects we could do around the house, repaint the kitchen, clean the attic. He agreed, but then said that I worried about too much and that he was fine, just fine. It's like an early retirement a dress rehearsal. Then he sat up alert. Your mother said she was making us pancakes, right? Right. I took another picture of him, which he liked. Then he took one of me. I was gonna make one to take one of the two of us, but then mother came in in a rush of goodwill and heaps of pancakes piled on two plates. I couldn't find any trays, so you'll have to balance the plates, she apologized. She headed for the door with a farewell. Enjoy, Arthur waved her back in. Stay with us, Sarah, we can watch the West Wing together. But mother was insistent. She had something she had to go investigate. I said, oh, these smell so good. And I, I drowned my pancakes in syrup. Arthur took a bite and another wiped his lips, set his fork down. He looked at me with a crooked, slightly quizzical smile. I asked him what was the matter. Didn't he like the pancakes? He said, I don't know. I can't smell them and they taste like nothing. Arthur. Arthur. When wasn't I paying attention? Oh God, what air did you breathe that I didn't share? God have mercy. Oh God have mercy. Oh, shut up. Shut up.